Uh, tonight we're having uh, Dr. Phil Hirschenfeld speaking on siblings, what they do with us, to us, for us, and against us. And many of us know all about siblings. Um, so we are very lucky to have him speaking to us. He's uh, uh, trained at Einstein uh, Medical Center and is a supervising and training analyst here at New York Psychoanalytic. He's been teaching about child development and uh, psychology for over 30 years and has had an active private practice uh, in Manhattan as well. So he's going to speak to us about maybe about, what, 20, 30 minutes? About 30 minutes on this topic, and that's why I was sort of handing out paper. So he'd like to, if we could save the questions and ask them, then we'll have a big question and answer period at the end. Hopefully we'll get to everybody. Okay, thanks. Thank you all for coming to tonight's dialogue on the sibling relationship. So as May said, I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. How's that? And then I hope it will be a dialogue. Re Research shows that we learn better when actively involved rather than passively listening. Also, it's harder to fall asleep when you're talking. So, let's all talk. Last year, we focused on sibling rivalry. Anybody here last year for this, that? Oh, good, I can repeat myself. Um, so tonight, I'd like to be more comprehensive and discuss the broader topic of the whole relationship although rivalry will be a part of the discussion. I'm going to tell you the topics that I'm going to discuss. Uh, a, a wonderful, revered teacher that we had here who died a few years ago, Charlie Brenner, said that when you give a talk, first tell them what you're going to say, then say it, then tell them what you did say. Uh, I'm going to skip the third part because that's, that's when we're going to dialogue. So here are the topics I'm going to talk about. As in most things in life, there are positives and negatives inherent in the sibling relationship. I'm going to talk about what parents can do to minimize the negative and enhance the positive how parents can be realistic about the power they do and do not have. What are the limits of what is permissible between siblings? How to lead by example. How to reinforce behaviors that you would like to see. The value of firm boundaries and rules for, child, for a child's development and the value of understanding. Some of these comments are about sensible child rearing in general, but I'm sure you will see how they can impact the sibling relationship. And finally, we'll talk about whatever all of you would like to discuss. You are all experts in certain sibling relationships and we can learn from each other. I'll be using some clinical examples from my practice. The personal details will be disguised for purposes of confidentiality, but the stories are true. So let's start by looking at the whole picture. Last year, the focus was on sibling rivalry because it is what gets the parents' attention. It is annoying and it's noisy, but there is much more to the relationship than rivalry. Our language contains emotionally impactful concepts such as sisterhood, brotherly love, band of brothers. An Oscar was won 10 days ago by Frozen. Any of you see it? See it. It's a story of the damage that cold can do in a sister relationship 
and how love can undo that harm. It's a story of hurt and repair, an endless cycle in most intimate relationships. Colleagues report that little girls in therapy play out that movie endlessly. Psychology has rightly emphasized the role of parents in the development of the child, but the role of siblings can be almost as crucial. They are sent a central part of the environment in which we develop. Freud is quoted as having said that poets from ancient times already knew everything that he had discovered. So let's listen to what one of our leading poets, Philip Roth, says about two brothers in his novel, The Counterlife. This quote is not from Roth himself, but from a literary biography about him and his work called Roth Unbound. It's a good book. Quote, in a work about changing places, the dual focus is on a pair of Jersey-born brothers, one headed for England, one for Israel. The relationship became central to the story even before Roth quite realized the importance of the relationship between them. Two very different men who had been the measure of each other all of their lives, each defining himself as what the other was not, the original counter lives. Henry, the good son, the family man, the defender of the norm. Nathan, the renegade, the family destroying writer, the gossip column womanizer, the star. Cain to your Abel, as Nathan says to Henry. Jacob to your Esau. From Nathan to Henry flows love and rue and more or less than benign condescension. On Henry's part, there is love and rue and a festering resentment that ultimately erupts in rage. Nicely said. That is a pretty good description of one unique sibling pair. And as a matter of fact, each sibling pair is unique. And it's rare that any relationship is only positive or negative. I always remember an interview in the Times of an elderly, long-married, self-aware woman. And do you love your husband, asked the reporter. She shot back, of course I love him, except for when I want to murder him. An honest woman. I did a survey of my practice last week, about 30 patients. In that week, 12 people spent a significant part of a session discussing a sibling. Positives, negatives, disappointments, gratifications. Eight people mentioned a sibling in a less intense way. Five did not say anything about the topic. And two of the five singletons mentioned the absence of a brother or sister. Siblings are part of our identity and how we see ourselves. And this is true if we love them or hate them or, as is usually the case, have a mixture of feelings. They have played a role for better and for worse in our formation. Here's a clinical example. A successful attorney was the middle child of three. Usually the eldest is described as rule-bound and responsible. Often this is true. It's a sociological truism, but not in this family. The older brother and the younger sister broke all the rules, distanced themselves from the family, and lived problematic lives from early on. This middle child followed the rules, 
was president of the student council and made law review. As an adult, he kept the family together on holidays and supported the parents in their old age. How come? There are probably many factors that went into his behavior, but one of them is this. We look for meaning in our lives. We construct a narrative that makes sense and sustains and explains and guides. Often we are not so conscious of that narrative, but it is there. Here is some of this man's long-standing narrative. Quote, I will be better than my older brother, who is spoiled by our father because they have the same first name and they look alike. I will show them who is the truly capable one. And also, quote, I will prove to my mother, who was so worried about sickly little sister, that I am the one in this family who was worthy of attention and care. We can see the positive, formative role that his siblings played in this man's character, development, and behavior. Therapy was useful in helping him become conscious of this self-created story, including another unhelpful chapter, namely, I will save my sad and beleaguered mother from her impossible, thankless burdens. In living out this part of the narrative, he compulsively involved himself with very troubled women so he could experience the role of the savior. This man's sibling relationships played a major role in who he became. So, if there are so many other aspects to this relationship, why all the emphasis on rivalry? Well, as I've already said, it is a pain in the neck to parents. And in an ideal world, enmity is not supposed to happen. Cain should not have killed Abel. Joseph should not have been sold to wandering Midianites. These events don't match up with the kind of narrative that we would like to tell about humankind. But they are all too human. Just as our brotherhood and sisterhood and self-sacrifice and altruism. Why do these hostilities get so intense? From the earliest age, we humans must survive in a, in, in a world of limited resources. This includes limited physical as well as emotional resources. Love and care and encouragement and interest are essential for normal human development. After World War II, the Swiss government decided to do away with all the mom and pop infant orphan orphanages that were the rule and build large, scientific, up-to-date, sterile, in all senses of the word, institutions. What happened? Many of the babies became sick and depressed, and some even died. Renee Spitz, a psychoanalyst, was asked to study the situation. And what he found was that the babies who did well were in the front rows of the nurseries, where the nurses who fed them were full of pep and energy and could engage with them emotionally as they fed them. Maybe by the fifth or the eighth infant, the nurse was a little depleted and thinking about lunch and just couldn't interact as affectively. These babies did poorly. But he also found occasional babies scattered throughout the ranks who did just fine. It seemed not to matter where they were located. 
Spitz found that these babies had built-in, highly engaging personalities, even for a worn-out caretaker. They could elicit what they needed in order to survive. Competition for resources is built in and impossible to eradicate. Modify it, yes. A young mother swore that her kids would not hate each other like she and her sister did. She completely prepared and reassured her three, three and a half year old when she found herself pregnant. She did everything by the book. She bought all the books. She told him stories about the new baby. She engaged the little boy in preparations. She sang songs about it. She elicited the grandparents to support him. And she hired a baby nurse for six weeks whose only focus was to be on the new infant. And it went great. See, she said, it doesn't have to be that way. Well, the six weeks was up. The baby nurse packed her bags and made her goodbyes, left the apartment. The little boy went tearing after her, yelling, lady, lady, you forgot your baby. <laughs> when it finally dawned on him what the real story was, the shit hit the fan. But it probably was better with him than with many others. Obviously, it doesn't always have to be really hard. And that's one of the things that we could talk about. Who here has a different story to tell and any ideas you have about what can make a difference? I asked a 12-year-old brother and his 13-year-old sister why they were so competitive with each other. They were in total agreement that it was all their parents' fault. That's where the agreement ended. The 12-year-old. They never see what she is doing to me. She's poking. She's hitting. And she gets all sorts of privileges that she doesn't deserve, like staying up late and watching our movies. They treat me like a baby. The 13-year-old. They overprotect that baby. And they blame me. And they never see how he starts everything by making fun of me. And then everybody laughs. By the way, humor is the traditional weapon of choice of the youngest. They're smaller. They don't know as much. They're weaker. But they can use humor. Great comedians who were the youngest include Mel Brooks, Eddie Murphy, Sarah Silverman, Howard Stern, Sid Caesar, and Joan Rivers. Are there any benefits to having siblings? Yes. Learning that the sun does not circle around you exclusively. Imagining that it does can lead to an unhappy life. If you remember, that was Joseph's dream. The sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to him. Which is okay for a kid to wish for. Most kids do in one way or another. But his dad, Jacob, encouraged such fantasies, made him a coat of many colors, and little Joe won the undying hatred of his older brothers. Not great parenting, I would maintain. On the other hand, and there always is another hand, maybe that fostered the grandiosity that helped him become the viceroy of Egypt. Things are complicated. Apparently, after a generation of mandated only children, China is having to deal with this difficult so social phenomenon 
of every body is a star, which does not imply that every singleton is doomed to a life of narcissism. If each time any child expresses feelings of entitlement, the parent counters that attitude effectively, that can make a difference. Little Johnny, why do I have to clean up my room? The maid can do it. That's what we pay her for. Mom, rolling her eyes, you have got to be kidding me. Maybe the maid can also go to the movies for you this afternoon. And so forth. Not harsh criticism, but consistent, a gentle pushback. Even the dreaded squabbling can teach a child val valuable lessons. How to argue and stand up for herself. How to compromise and pull back from the brink of nuclear warfare. However, there was, there was always the need for supervision with children because it sometimes can go nuclear. Furthermore, competition is not in itself a dirty word. The Williams sisters pushed each other to enormous heights. Competitive spirit leads to success. Sometimes in a family, the competition leads to this creative solution. You be the math and science guy, I'll do history and literature. You do baseball, I'll do basketball. That approach avoids, avoids the direct competition. Twins often use that approach. A bad outcome of the competition is for one or the other to just give up. How much can parents accomplish in monitoring and shaping the re relationship between siblings? Again, this is something somewhere where I'd like to hear what you people think about this. But here are some ideas that I think that can be useful. Lead by example. When I was a kid, somehow, my parents came into the possession of hundreds, if not thousands, of old readers' digests. And I read them all. And if you remember, at the end of long articles, where the article didn't go down to the bottom of the page, there'd be some little first-person filler story. And here's one I always, always remembered. A working man left the house early every morning to go to work. He walked down the block, stopped at the corner bar, went in for a liquid breakfast of a shot and a beer, and then went off to work. One morning, there was a foot of snow on the ground. And as he was trudging to the bar, he hears this little voice behind him, Daddy, Daddy, I'm walking in your footsteps. He claimed, and I hope truthfully, that he never walked to that bar again. Most kids are really keen observers of their surroundings. It's necessary for survival. And that includes observing parental feelings and behavior. If you are cool or distant or furious with your sibs, your kids probably know it. And that knowledge plays a role in how they feel about each other. Much human behavior is based on identification. It's how we feel close to each other. As the saying goes, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. Not uncommonly, when there's a loss, like a man's father dies, a few months later, he finds that he has grown a mustache for the first time in his life. Then he realizes his father had a mustache. Identification. Your parents' sibling relationships probably informed your own. And it's often a losing proposition to say to kids, do as I say, not as I do. Plus, even if your behavior is exemplary, your kids will probably understand your underlying feelings. Nevertheless, it pays to try. 
Here are some other things worth trying. Be fair. And that is not always possible. And when you can't be fair, try to be honest about what you're doing and why you're doing it within the individual child's capacity to understand. For example, a man came into treatment, smart, capable, likable, with the chief complaint, I am always shooting myself in my foot, in school, in relationships, at work. To make a very long short story short, what we discovered was that he had a lifelong envy of his younger brother, who developed normally up until age two, when he had started walking, and then started tripping, and then was diagnosed as a degen with a degenerative neurological disease, and spent the next 15 years slowly dying. The love and the worry and the attention that were showered on this younger child are what this man craved. And he kept, quote, shooting myself in the foot unconsciously in order to get it. His parents clearly had to do what they had to do. But it could have been very helpful if they had honestly talked with him about what they were doing, why they were doing it, and that they understood what kind of an effect it had on him, being ignored, being always left out. This is a dramatic instance, but I think minor versions of this kind of thing happen every day. Another suggestion. Underline and reinforce the behavior that you want rather than criticize what you don't like, but do it thoughtfully. Quote, I know how your sister sometimes is a real pain, but it was so thoughtful of you when you helped her out yesterday. That was really great. You may have seen that recent research that was in the news a few weeks ago on what to tell kids about their performance on a test. They took a classroom of children at different ages, 8, 10, 12, always had the same results. They gave the class a test. Then they divided the class in half. Half the class were told individually, wow. That test showed you are so smart. This half the class did worse on the next test. The other half the class, they said, I saw how hard you worked at that test. You didn't give up. I really admire that. This half the class did better on the next test. It makes sense. We want to encourage a good work ethic or we want to encourage thoughtfulness, or generosity, or whatever. Underline it. With these kids, a focus on grades simply made them more anxious. Be firm. There's a lot of good research that indicates that firm rules produce less anxious children. I think it helps children internalize standards, trust themselves, and feel confident that they can control their own impulses. Feeling out of control of one's own impulses is a major source of anxiety in kids and in adults. That old woman who said she sometimes wanted to murder her husband knew that there was no chance that she would actually murder him. So she could think about and express her anger without guilt or anxiety. Does this mean that a million rules are necessary? No, just a few that are non-negotiable. This is your bedtime, period. 
No electronic gadgets before homework, period. We all sit down and eat dinner with utensils and talk politely to each other, period. And we don't hit our brother or our sister in this family. There will be consequences. A lot has been written about guilty parenting in today's society. Both parents may be out of the house. They feel they don't spend enough time with the kids. Therefore, let's be nice to Susie and let her stay up till whenever or sleep in our bed or, subs or subsist on a diet of Cracker Jacks and cherry soda. None of that is really being nice to Susie in the sense of helping her grow up and achieve her potential. I'm not advocating harshness, just a realistic evaluation how, of how, how able a child is and expecting her to perform. And that includes reasonable demands on how kids treat each other. I know you're angry, you can talk about it, you can't hit. Anna Freud wrote about her wise family doctor when she was a child, who would admonish the ladies of the household for petting and indulging and, in, and spoiling a sick child. That can lead to a craving for disability so that one will get all the perks of being sick, like the man with the ill younger brother. You would be surprised, or maybe not, how often clear guidelines are missing in a family. I was consulted by a Russian family, smart, attractive, successful, very tall people. They had a four-year-old daughter and a baby. The nursery school suggested a hearing evaluation. They thought she was deaf. Her, her hearing was perfect. I saw her in consultation. She was cute and responsive, separated easily from her parents. She played imaginatively in my office with the toys. And all the play in, in the consultation was around one theme. She took out all the animals in the farm, the horses, the pigs, the cows, the sheep. And there was one teeny little kitten. All the animals had to listen to that little kitten or there would be big trouble. Guess who that kitten represented? I said to her finally, time's up, time to clean up the toys. She was deaf yet again. I said, well, I'll get mommy and daddy. I brought in mommy and daddy. And I said, time's up. And they started negotiating with her in Russian for a few minutes. Then they turned to me helplessly and said, she won't go. The reason I emphasized how they were both tall, around six or more, he was more than six feet tall, and to see them standing there helplessly with this teeny little girl. I said, pick her up. They had never thought of that. This family dynamic was not helpful for this little girl in teaching her how to live in the real world or in teaching her how to live in this family. She was totally intolerant of mother spending any time with the baby brother. Next, don't expect perfection or that everything is in your control. Much is not within parental control, no matter how sensitive and well-meaning they may be. A very successful orthopedist grew up in the Ozarks, 
in poverty with many younger brothers and sisters. He was the eldest. He was always hungry. I mean, they weren't, they weren't that poor. There was no food, but he was a growing boy. He was always hungry. Every once in a while, his father shot a deer. And he loved the venison. And he was so crafty about getting himself the biggest piece, sneaking some of it off of his younger brother's plate. Plus, he got all the new clothes. And then everything was handed down to the younger children in the family. As a successful adult, he said, everything, every time I get something good, it turns into ashes in my mouth. It feels like I robbed it from the mouths of my siblings. Now, his parents knew nothing about all of this. I'm not sure there was anything, well, maybe if they had known, but they didn't. They were working very hard at doing a good job, raising their family. All the kids ended up educated and doing well. And I think this would be a surprise to them and anybody in the family, his perpetual guilt. And even if you have all the time in the world for the kids, there will be competition for resources. You cannot supply everything, and you don't want to. Total care should be reserved for nursing homes. Another reason that not everything is under parental control is that some kids are just more difficult to parent and to figure out than others to understand what they are struggling with, what might send a particular child over the edge. And as many parents know, you can have an easy child and a hard child in the same family. And how do you balance that? Each person is born with his or her own biology and ease of regulation. And when your own issues come up against the child's, that makes it even harder. A survey was done of mothers of two-year-olds, where the mothers were asked a series of questions about sleeping and toilet training and behavior and eating and a million other things. So they got with one mother to ask him about her two-year-old. So what's it like with feeding her? Feed her. It's ruining my life. We scream. We fight. It's ruining our relationship. The only thing this kid eats is ketchup. The next mother. This is a real story. You can't make this stuff up. The next mother. And what is it like with eating? Eating, it's a dream. She eats everything I put on her plate. All I have to do is drown it in ketchup. <laughs> she eats it. Even Cheerios. One mother's own anxiety around eating made it impossible for her to be flexible and creative in this department. Be understanding, and be understanding out loud. Quote, I know it is hard for you, Susie, when your sister is the center of her birthday party and everything is all about her and she is getting all the presents. Put those feelings into words for her. She may not even know these words. She may just know that she's angry. Let her know that you understand. Let her know that her birthday is coming in four months and then she will be at the center. Should we buy Susie a present also on her sister's birthday? There is the question. And as often, the answer is, it depends. It depends on Susie's age. 
and her maturity and her flexibility and her frustration tolerance. All we do know for sure is that if Susie is 20 and she still needs a present on her sister's birthday, we have a problem. This balance is why Freud called teaching, psychoanalysis, and parenting the three impossible professions. What is impossible? That they each require the same exquisite balance of frustration and gratification in order to promote optimal growth. Too much gratification promotes passivity and dependence. Too much frustration promotes hopelessness and giving up. What he said is impossible is to hit that exact sweet spot between the two. And I think I will end it here and let's talk. When I was growing up, my parents weren't much about explaining things to us. I grew up in a family of four. So we had to fend for ourselves and figure it out. Middle. Now, it's all about explaining and talking and talking through and talking more and talking. I think we all ended up fine and happy and all right and normal, right? So. Is there too much talking happening these days to kids? Do you know what I mean? Like, is there just too much? Yeah, but I feel like when we were growing up, it was really, you know, you got in a fight with your sibling and you got in a fight with your sibling. And now it's, talk to him and talk to her and then talk together and then talk separate and it's just
want to add to the complexity that you have been talking about and something that you did allude to, which is the relationship of the parents to their own siblings, which has an enormous influence on the relationship between the siblings and how they look at number one, two, and three, depending on where they were in their birth order in the first place. And then the second influence, or not the, among all the other influences, when there's a child who can't, a girl who can't figure out about her relationship with her father, whom she loves and she can't be angry with, she therefore is angry at the brother. It has nothing to do with the brother, but unless that part is understood, it doesn't get worked out. So I'm just adding to the complexity of what you're talking about. Um, in a case when the siblings are fighting with each other and you arrive on to the two of them fighting and um, you stop them, I mean I stop them, and they go like, he started, no, she started, no, she's, and I go, oh, no, no, oh, you never listen to me, it's always here, she, she's right, no, I'm wrong. So what's the best way to handle that? I say, I don't want to hear anything, just stop talking. <laughs> but I don't know if I'm doing something wrong. I do have two dogs, and I have siblings. No, I would say step one would be to just, since you're right, you don't actually know what happened. So I think step one is you've got to get them to stop fighting. Step two, what, what we heard before is there's no hitting in this family, so just lay down that law. And then actually you've got to play Solomon and actually hear both sides and maybe try to figure out objectively who seems to be telling the truth, maybe. That's my guess. Of dealing with this exact issue in which the parent would say, your sibling said X, Y, Z, and then turns to the other sibling and listens to him and says to the first sibling, your sibling said A, B, C, so that they're not triangled in and after you do this two or three times, you're so bored, they go off and play. <laughs> or so he wrote in his popular book. I think the other element is he's not taking, the parents not taking sides. I think that's. When my sons were about um, four and eight, and uh, there was a terrible brouhaha going on in one of their rooms, and I went in there, and um, I don't know, one or both were crying, and um, the little one who tended to cause more trouble than the older one 
um, said that his brother had hit him first, and his brother, who was always very good, um, explained to me that, no, that was not what happened, that he had, uh, his little brother had started it. And <clears throat> I believe the older one. And about 15 years later, <laughs> they both admitted to me at the same time that, in well, the older one said, I really did provoke it. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you learn. Now, there's one parent who doesn't want to know anything, and there's one parent who really has tremendous difficulty knowing anything. I'm amazed that with therapy, doing some of the things that you advocated, he has gotten better. But this issue persists, which is more of a problem for the parents than him. I wonder if you have any comments.
that four-year-old. I have um, one child who has very selective hearing. She's nine now, and it's been going on since she can hear and follow directions, so maybe like one or something like that. And then my younger one, who's two years younger, is listens really well. If you say you got to go, we go. We put on our shoes. And then the other one, you tell them four or five times. You start throwing in the incentives or taking away the privileges, and it's still you know, going on to a decade now, and is there, do I just keep going like that, or what? 